Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning and good evening, depending on where you're um, logging in from. Uh, my name is Nura Lori. I'm an assistant professor of international relations at the Pardee School of Global Studies at Boston University. Um, and it is my absolute pleasure to introduce our today's speaker, um, uh, Professor Erin Chung, who will be joining us. I think at, at any minute we'll, we'll see her video come up. There she is. Um, so first of all, welcome to the, the international, um, to the Myron Wiener uh, uh, seminar series on in international migration. This is organized by the Inter-University Committee for International Migration, which is a consortium of universities in the Boston area. And um, you know, one of the beautiful things about the, the highlights of this new Zoom world we find ourselves in is that we're able to reach such a global audience. So thank you for the attendees uh, for coming. And um, please, we encourage you to use the Q&A uh, box to, to ask any questions. And um, it's uh, before we, we start, I also just want to point out that we have um, Louise, Drew, Dr. Louise Drew, who is one of the founding members of this Myron Wiener Seminar Series, and, and Professor Anna Hardman, who's also here, um, who, who's an, another member of the, the steering committee. So thank you for the committee members for being here. Um, and without further ado, it's really my pleasure to introduce Professor uh, Aaron Chung today, who is um, ha has several books and, um, you know, it, it's an uh, uh, um, sorry, there we go, is the Charles D. Miller Associate Professor of East Asian Politics at the Department of Political Science at Johns Hopkins University. She previously served as the director of the East Asia, uh, Asian Studies Program and co-directs the Racism, Immigration, and Citizenship Program at, at Johns Hopkins. Um, this is, she's going to be talking about her second book. Her first book, Immigration, Citizenship, Japan, came out with Cambridge University Press in 2010. It was also translated in, in Japanese in 2012. And then this book is a culmination of a comparative project across um, East Asia and um, uh, uh, Immigrant Incorporation East Asian Democracies, which also came out with Cambridge University Press um, in 2020. On a more personal note, I will say that I'm very, very honored to be here today. Professor Chang was um, uh, really critical in, in helping me find my own voice as a scholar. She was on my dissertation committee. She's seen so many different iterations of my work over the years, and it's really um, a pleasure and an honor to be able to, to, to be here and, and um, lead this discussion. As I said, please uh, ask any questions from at any point, and, and we will make sure to try to get to them in the discussion. So without pr uh, further ado, please, Professor Chang, welcome and thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Nuda. It's um, such a pleasure to be here. Um, I really want to thank uh, Professor Laurie for inviting me and uh, Laura Kerwin for organizing my visit. Um, so before we started this, uh, Professor Laurie and I were uh, just talking about my last visit to Boston um, when I participated in a panel on citizenship and migration in East Asia at uh, Boston University in November 2019, which was actually one of the last in-person and talks that I gave uh, before the pandemic. And um, as Professor Laurie mentioned, my book was published last October uh, in the middle of the pandemic. Um, and obviously I hadn't quite envisioned uh, that I would be giving virtual book talks uh, upon the publication of my book, but I'm really grateful that I'm able to share my work with you uh, through this platform. And I very much look forward to returning to the Boston area uh, sometime soon. Uh, so I'm just going to give you first a very brief um, background to my book. And um, what I'll do is go ahead uh, and share my screen as I do so. OK. All right, is it, does it look OK? All right. All yes, right. Perfect. Thank you. So my book compares uh, three similarly situated liberal democracies in Northeast Asia to shed insights into how past struggles for democracy shape current movements for immigrant rights and recognition. And largely I'm putting immigrant agency at the center of analysis to ask why foreign residents make the political choices they do as they become permanent members of their receiving societies. And the project is, uh, itself is based on field work and archival research that I conducted over a seven year period in Japan, South Korea, 
and Taiwan. That included over 150 interviews with migrants, activists, and government officials, as well as original focus groups with over 20 immigrant uh, communities. And I just want to plug my data verse, which is um, so in Japan, these focus groups uh, included uh, residents uh, from China, South Korea, uh, Brazil, Peru, Philipp the Philippines, Bangladesh, and Ethiopia. Uh, in Korea, uh, these included uh, immigrants from Vietnam, uh, from China, uh, Taiwan, uh, Philippines, Mongolia, and Burma. And then in Taiwan, uh, these included Vietnamese, Indonesian, Filipino, Thai, mainland Chinese, and uh, Malaysian residents. And uh, I'm showing you the slide because 16 of the Japan and Korea focus groups from the study have been archived by the Johns Hopkins University Data Management Services and are available to the public for downloads. So I'm just showing you this page. So you can actually go to this page um, by just Googling um, Immigrant Incorporation East Asian Democracies Project or IIEAD project. And here you can either download um, all of the transcripts from Japan and South Korea, or uh, you can just um, uh, click on uh, one um, of the uh, data uh, sets and then choose individual uh, transcripts. And these include both the original um, uh, uh, language uh, transcripts as well well as the um, English translations. And um, I just want to briefly um, uh, kind of describe or explain why we don't have any of the Taiwan focus group transcripts in the archive. Um, so unlike um, Japan and South Korea, it was actually very difficult for us to organize focus groups in Taiwan because uh, most of the uh, uh, migrants either lived very far away in kind of more remote, remote areas that were close to the factories where they worked or they were uh, domestic workers who had um, rarely had a day off and I'll be describing this more. Um, so in this included um, some workers, some, some domestic workers who had um, had a day off only in the last uh, three months, some in the last six months, and some had never had a day off, right? And so many of the um, focus groups that we did with them ended up being a little bit more haphazard and were conducted with their employers. So with the, with the um, elderly that, um, uh, man or woman that they were um, in charge of um, at public parks or in the hospital. Um, and um, so uh, we wanted to uh, basically make sure that their identities were completely anonymized um, because they were worried about um, their job security and so forth. So that's why we don't have um, the um, focus group transcripts for, for the Taiwan group. Uh, so basically I focused my research on immigration politics in uh, Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan because they represent three similar cases, right? They're all relatively rich liberal democracies that have dissent-based citizenship policies and among the most restrictive immigration policies in the world, especially relative to their levels of development, which is why they're often described as negative cases of immigration, right? So compared to their European counterparts that have experienced heightened immigration since the mid 1960s and 1970s, the three countries recent encounters came much later with the lion's share arriving from the late 1980s, largely from other parts of Asia. And while the total foreign population has grown um, almost uh, two, by twofold in Japan, uh, over threefold in Taiwan, and over 12-fold in Korea, immigrants continue to make up a relatively small percentage of the total population in all three countries at approximately 2 to 5%. Now the dominant comparative scholarship on immigration and citizenship has tended to focus on cultural determinants, especially claims of ethno-cultural homogeneity to explain the so-called East Asian paradox. Now, according to this count, this is a very crude and brief way of, of summarizing, uh, East Asian democracies represent exclusionary or ethnic citizenship and immigration regimes that uh, privilege dissent over liberal norms. Now I found these accounts uh, largely unsatisfying because they tend to overlook the significant cross-national variations between the three countries, as well as the intranational contradictions. 
Um, they also tell us very little about the immigrants themselves as political actors in their own right. So by comparing three East Asian democracies with overlapping citizenship and immigration policies, I wanted to analyze what the process of immigrant incorporation was like among so-called exclusionary cases, right? Now, before proceeding, I just want to briefly explain what I mean by immigrant political incorporation, which um, my um, usage of the term is not equivalent to naturalization, right? So, so instead I define immigrant incorporation as the process by which immigrants and their descendants shift their status from sojourners to political participants who make claims as permanent members of their receiving societies. And I'm largely focusing on uh, four areas. Uh, the first being immigrant self-identification and understandings of their membership. Uh, secondly, immigrant political participation Third, the policies, programs, and services that target immigrants, as well as state institutionalized rights. And finally, policy reforms. Now, given the similarities between their immigration and citizenship policies, as well as their overlapping immigrant populations that are largely from neighboring Asian countries that I mentioned before, and their common dilemmas as liberal democracies that have since 2005, competed with each other largely for the less than desirable distinction of having the world's fastest aging population, lowest birth rate, and most rapidly shrinking workforce. I expected to find a singular or at least a similar model of immigrant incorporation among the three Northeast Asian uh, democracies. But instead, I found dramatic cross-national variations between three seemingly similar systems, especially from the mid-2000s. So in Korea, the arrival of migrant labor generated centralized rights-based rights movements and eventually sweeping policy measures that included the implementation of a guest worker program in 2004, the extension of local voting rights to permanent foreign residents in 2006, making Korea the first and only country to do so in Asia, and the passage of a dual nationality bill in 2010. Now, while there were no structural reforms in Japan until 2019, decentralized grassroots movements and partnerships between local governments and civil society organizations generated an assortment of local services and programs for foreign residents that ranged from what may be seen as kind of the more typical like cultural exchange programs to the more substantive like housing and employment assistance um, to foreign resident assemblies, right? In fact, foreign resident rights and social welfare provisions for those who are already settled within Japan are among the most generous of liberal democracies. Finally, while Taiwan was the first among the three countries to implement a guest worker program, it's been the slowest in addressing immigrant rights and welfare, as well as labor protections for migrant workers and local support services for foreign residents. Now, my argument in a nutshell is um, basically centering on the concept of civic legacies that I'll be introducing momentarily. Um, and is based on the idea that past struggles for democracy shape current movements for immigrant rights and recognition. So I'm just gonna show you um, this kind of um, an outline of my um, book chapters um, to kind of describe how I go about the argument. So I'm looking largely at three levels of variation. First, um, cross-regional differences between uh, immigration and citizenship regimes in East Asia and those in Western liberal democracies. Uh, secondly, cross-national variations between three countries with descent-based citizenship policies that are conventionally described as exclusionary in their policies toward immigrants. And finally, intranational variations between immigration and citizenship policies and practices among different migrant subcategories, right? So basically, after I introduce the concept of civic legacies in chapter one, I examine the uh, cross-regional differences between East Asian and Western citizenship regimes in chapter two. 
and identify distinct civic legacies in East Asian democracies, namely uh, local grassroots movements in Japan, uh, national rights-based movements in South Korea, and then finally ethnicity-based coalitions in Taiwan. Now, chapter three, which is the focus of my uh, presentation today, explains the cross-national variations between the three countries. Um, I then examine the intranational variations among the migrant subcategories in chapter four uh, through a discussion of my focus group data. Chapter five then zooms in on one specific category of migrants, that is non-citizen female spouses of native citizens that are often referred to as marriage migrants, who have become uh, one of the most important immigrant populations in East Asia. And then finally, chapter six brings us back full circle to convergent policies, where I examine the emergence of three distinct frameworks for immigrant incorporation uh, in East Asian democracies that are based on variants of multiculturalism. Okay. Now, based on their exclusionary immigration and citizenship policies, we could expect that all three East Asian democracies would have actually followed Taiwan's trajectory, namely one that maintained an exclusionary migration regime with weak protections and underdeveloped services for migrants. Certainly global human rights norms had not pushed the three East Asian democracies toward liberal immigration and citizenship policies, uh, which uh, the so-called convergence hypothesis would predict, right? Um, nor were domestic political elites, such as bureaucrats and left-leaning parties or activist courts, the drivers for immigration liberalization and expanded migrant rights as the research that is, uh, that are that is largely based on case studies of North American and Western European countries have found. Now, if we applied a teleological framework to understanding migration governance that's based on um, democratic development, then we should expect that Japan as a mature democracy would have liberalized its immigration policies well before Korea and Taiwan, which are both relatively young democracies. And democratization itself was not the driver for liberalization since Korea and Taiwan both underwent a democratic transition in the late 1980s and are widely recognized as having consolidated their democracies at least from, um, at least by the early 2000s, right? And finally, uh, left-leaning parties or competitive, or competitive par uh, political party system um, do not sufficiently explain the cross-national variations in immigrant incorporation patterns among these three similar migration regimes because, you know, we could say, for example, that um, in the LDP, the Liberal De Democratic Party's almost uninterrupted rule since 1955 in Japan um, may uh, explain the lack of structural reform, right? But in fact, it was under the watch of the LDP that foreign resident rights expanded to make Japan one of the most generous of liberal democracies, right, in this area. And the ascendance of Taiwan's Democratic Progressive Party, which championed multiculturalism and the expansion of women's rights and made Taiwan the most LGBTQ friendly country in Asia with the legalization of same sex marriage in 2019 was not accompanied by more liberal immigration or immigrant policies. And on the contrary, the rise of the Democratic Progressive Party was accompanied by greater immigration restrictions. So in Japan, Korea, and Taiwan, immigration reform, immigrant incorporation, and migrant rights became an important part of the equation only when civil society actors forced them onto the agenda. Which is, which is an insight that other studies of immigration politics in East Asia have contributed, as well as studies um, uh, that have emerged in um, studies of the United States and, and Europe. But our three cases highlight that the presence of civil society alone is insufficient for explaining cross-national variations in immigrant incorporation patterns. Not all civil society actors sought to advocate for migrant rights, right? Or to even incorporate migrants into their local societies because civil society after all can be the source of both pro-migrant advocacy as well as anti-migrant mobilization as we all know. 
For example, labor unions, right, have historically played and in some cases continue to play a central roles in calling for restrictive immigration policies. So rather than assume that civil society actors confront the challenges of immigrant incorporation in a uniform way, or that civil society actors necessarily seek to incorporate immigrants in their local societies, I introduced the concept of civic legacies to refer to the ideas, networks, and strategies applied in past struggles for democratic inclusion that differentially shape the direction of immigrant incorporation and the potential for structural reform. Now, although civic legacies do not determine immigrant incorporation patterns, they form the opportunities and constraints that demarcate the rules of the game for migrant claim making, right? So in other words, the language, symbols, and strategies used in past struggles for democratic inclusion shape how civil society actors, including migrants themselves, give voice to migrant interests, mobilize migrant actors, and shape public debate and policy on immigration. Civic legacies also influence the prioritization of issues and agendas among civil society actors. That is the distinct civic legacies shape which civil society actors choose to advocate for which migrants and why, as well as the strategies and ideas that they employ to make claims to the state, right? Because after all, grassroots movements by immigrants and their supporters do not transpire in a vacuum, right? On the contrary, the residuals of prior struggles for democratic citizenship shape contemporary citizenship practices. Now, of course, international norms and movements and new state and non-state actors may provide additional tools um, or they ch may challenge or alter the dominant discourse or shift agendas in civil society, but I'm arguing that their impact on the ground is mediated by civic legacies. So we should thus expect to find that civil society mobilization and advocacy for non-citizens mirror those applied to preceding generations of citizen women, workers, minority groups, and others who've historically been denied full citizenship status and or rights. So the civic legacies framework thus helps us to understand how similarly restrictive immigration policies in East Asia generated divergent immigrant incorporation patterns. I'm going to now discuss um, our three cases and I'll start each case with a quote from um, our, uh, my focus groups. So this first one is from uh, the Han Chinese focus group interview in Korea. Quote, without the emphasis on human rights in Korean society, undocumented workers like us would not be able to have what we have. I don't think I broke the law because I didn't commit a crime. I didn't murder or rob. I just worked illegally. I got work because the factory was in need of workers and the Korean bosses like to hire illegal workers. In Korea, human rights are meant to protect everyone. Unquote. So migrant advocacy in South Korea built on the civic legacy of national rights-based movements, specifically the country's recent democratization movement and a strong tradition of labor and civil society activism to push for structural change. So not only did the mistreatment of migrant workers and you know, police crackdowns of undocumented migrants resonate strikingly with the abusive practices and political repression of Korea's past authoritarian regimes, but the language and tactics that migrant workers used in their protests were almost identical to those of the labor movements in Korea's recent past. So slogans such as, we are human, not animals, and we are not slaves came to epitomize the migrant workers movements, much like we are not machines represented the Korean workers movement of the uh, movements of the 1970s and 1980s. Um, so this slide uh, compares um, the anti-government protests during the 1980s democratization movement and a migrant worker protest in 2003 that was led by the Korean Federation um, of Trade Unions. And you can see that there are striking parallels in terms of the confrontational tactics that are used against the riot police, um, the, uh, the use of particular symbols and imagery that um, perhaps is not as obvious in these slides, but that some of the slogans that are um, 
on the clothing or that are on um, headscarves um, or um, other signs um, are, are strikingly similar, even the colors that are often used. Um, and even um, the preparation for these demonstrations, like the use of uh, face masks, you know, knowing that tear gas will be widely applied and that this is a good way to sort of um, protect yourself from tear gas um, is not necessarily coincidental. This is a learned um, type of protest strategy. And even the site of protest, right, has been replicated. So this is a slide comparing the June 1987 and November 2003 protests in front of the Myeongdong Cathedral in Seoul, which uh, many have described as the traditional stage and refuge of anti-government protesters in the era of military rule. So um, just by um, staging their protest in front of this historical um, area, right, um, where the democratization movement was um, was really kind of uh, found its home, uh, lended the migrant workers movement with a significant amount of symbolic and political uh, capital and potency. Right? Now, what is especially noteworthy about Korea's migrant advocacy organizations is their position within Korea's democratization movement and post-1987 democratic consolidation. In other words, these groups represent a cross-section of Korea civil society that includes moderate and radical labor groups, women's organizations, religious institutions, and a range of progressive citizen groups whose leaders had deep roots in Korea's democratization movement. So their strong tradition of activism coupled with the reconfiguration of political power from the late 1990s that is with the inauguration of the first opposition president, Kim Dae-jung in 1998, and a former human rights activist and labor lawyer, No Mu-hyun in 2003, let the struggle for migrant labor rights significant potency and magnitude in Korean society. Because after all, how could a pro-labor government condone exploitative practices toward migrant laborers that many in the administration, including the president himself, had struggled against for decades. Okay, we're going to now move um, to the uh, Japan uh, uh, case. And this is a quote from um, a Chinese focus group uh, interview in Tokyo. Quote, in most areas of life, Japanese and foreigners share the same benefits such as child allowances, as long as they, foreigners, are registered residents. Permanent residents are treated the same as Japanese in policy except in the area of political rights, unquote. So in Japan, migrant advocacy built on the civic legacy of local grassroots movements for democratic inclusion that set the foundation for decentralized community-based strategies that ultimately pose barriers to restructuring migrant labor policies. So despite their labor shortages, both Japan and Korea opted for piecemeal solutions to temporarily meet labor demands rather than opening their borders to foreign labor for decades, right? So these include, as many of you may know, preferential policies for co-ethnic immigrants who provided a relatively ample pool of unskilled workers who were not classified as foreign labor. So these are largely co-ethnic immigrants. Um, so Japanese, uh, ethnic Japanese from Brazil and Peru and Japan case and ethnic uh, Koreans uh, from China in Korea's case. Uh, and the second kind of um, side door uh, policy was uh, through the industrial trainee programs that uh, similarly created a, a relatively a, a large pool of cheap labor who were not recognized as workers and thus uh, not entitled to the rights and protections of uh, labor laws. Now the industrial trainee system in particular generated a host of problems for both Japan and Korea. So this included exploitative practices by employers, as well as a rapidly growing population of undocumented workers among the industrial trainees. And similar to Korea, hundreds of civil society organizations in Japan played key roles in providing services and advocacy for foreign workers. But the difference is that the industrial trainee system remains intact and Japan's borders remained closed to unskilled work, uh, immigration until uh, 2019. 
Now, the 2018 bill that went into effect in 2019 uh, basically opened uh, Japan's borders to up to 345,000 semi-skilled workers in agriculture, construction, uh, shipbuilding, hospitality, and nursing over, over a five-year period. Um, and it is significant because it marks the first time in post-war uh, Japan's history that the country's borders are officially open to unskilled foreign labor. But what is especially noteworthy is that the establishment of an official guest worker program has not been accompanied by legislative moves to abolish the industrial trainee program, suggesting that the former, the industrial trainee program, um, is meant to complement um, rather than replace. Um, so I'm sorry, the former, the, um, the, the new guest worker program is meant to complement rather than replace the industrial trainee system, which is in contrast to Korea, uh, which um, where the industrial trainee program was abolished after the establishment of a, a formal uh, guest worker uh, program. So instead of structural change, immigrant incorporation in Japan has occurred largely at the local level with decentralized grassroots organizations taking the lead. Now, unlike Korea, Japan had a seemingly natural ally for new migrants, that is the multi-generational Korean residents that are known as Zainichi Koreans uh, in Japanese, who had succeeded in gaining rights and recognition for foreign residents through what I call a non-citizen civil rights movement. So these are largely colonial era migrants who migrated to uh, the, the Japanese metropole and, and, and did not return to uh, the Korean peninsula. So by the time that Japan had encountered its most recent wave of immigration from the late, late 1980s, Zainichi Korean activists and their supporters had reached the final stages of their movement, right? So beginning with the landmark Hitachi employment discrimination trial of the early 1970s in which a Korean plaintiff successfully sued the Hitachi company for employment discrimination, Korean residents made dramatic gains in their claims to citizenship rights and access to the labor market through lawsuits and local campaigns. And by 1980, foreign residents were eligible for social welfare benefits and public sector jobs in cities such as Nagoya, Osaka, Kawasaki, Kobe, and Tokyo, right? And this uh, kind of culminated in the largest mass mobilization of Korean residents and their supporters in post-war Japan. Here I'm referring to the decade-long anti-fingerprinting movement in the 1980s that succeeded in abolishing the fingerprinting requirement for special permanent residents in 1993 and for all foreign residents in 1999. And um, the basic argument um, that uh, Koreans and other foreign residents gave was that um, by having to submit their fingerprints at the age of 16 and above, um, uh, foreign residents were being criminalized. They actually had to submit all 10 of their fingerprints and it was considered to be a really very degrading experience um, that um, their neighbors and, and, and you know, friends had never had to experience. Um, now the fingerprinting requirement was uh, in fact reinstated in 2007 for um, all foreign residents except for Zainichi uh, Koreans. And uh, this is a cover image from uh, the cover image from my first book, uh, which is um, an anti fingerprinting rally in Tokyo in 2007, which was in response to the reinstatement of that um, requirement. And um, what's probably quite noticeable is how uh, sparsely attended it is, right? So there aren't as many. Um, uh, nearly as many um, uh, uh, demonstrators as, as there were during the um, uh, 1980s fingerprinting requirement. And what is most significant is that the only group of Koreans that attended this rally is right here. <laughs> and these, uh, so these are actually representatives from the Korean Youth Association, um, which is kind of the youth uh, organization of the pro South Korea Mindan organization. And they were not even planning to attend the rally, but they got a last minute urgent call from uh, Amnesty International, um, you know, you really begging them to show some Korean representation um, in this rally since Koreans had been um, central to the original anti fingerprinting. Uh, movement and at the very last minute they decided to attend and they found that the old um, 
uh, anti-fingerprinting balloon that they used in the rally and blew it up just in time for the rally only to show up and find so few people were there. In fact, many in many cases, it, it appeared that um, there were more members of the media than there were uh, protesters, which um, really does signify kind of the ways in which um, you know, the foreign resident movement has really declined, but specifically the ways in which there's uh, not as much solidarity between uh, the the so-called uh, the multi-generational Korean residents and uh, the newer immigrants. So rather than lead the movement for immigration reform and the expansion of migrant workers' rights, Zainichi Korean activists have largely distanced themselves from migrant workers and instead have absorbed new migrants into existing programs and movements that reflect more the interests of their multi-generational community and less those of recent immigrants. Now, on the one hand, this means that immigrants with a secure legal status benefited from the civic legacies of earlier movements by Zainichi Koreans that made foreign residents eligible for a range of social welfare benefits and legal protections against employment and housing discrimination that were really out of their reach until the late 1970s and early 1980s. But on the other hand, because existing foreign resident services and programs were created for permanently settled, highly assimilated, and in many cases, native born non-national residents, most local communities were ill-equipped to address some of the specific needs of migrant workers. So um, one example would be um, when I interviewed some of the uh, more recently arrived um, uh, foreign residents in Kawasaki City, um, you know, quite a few of them would talk about kind of the incongruity between um, the pressure that they were getting from uh, foreign residents who were in the foreign resident assembly and others who were basically saying, you need to fight for your local voting rights. So for, you know, foreign residents need to fight for their local voting rights to get their voice heard. And they would say to me, I can barely speak Japanese, right? I don't even know where to send my children to school um, or you know, where, where my local hospital is or what I'm even eligible for in terms of healthcare. And here, you know, everyone is telling me I need to fight for my local voting rights, right? When I can't even take care of my own basic rights, right? So because the Zainichi Korean movement from the 1960s made claims to citizenship rights on the basis of their permanent settlement as tax paying law abiding residents. The ideational frame of what is called the foreign resident citizen widened the gap between legally registered long term foreign residents and unauthorized migrant workers. Okay. Um, Sorry, um, we're going to now go to the final case, um, which is the Taiwan case, and this is an, uh, a quote from the Vietnamese focus group interview in, in, uh, in Taipei. Quote, a lot of people don't care whether you have a Taiwanese ID, but look at your accent and think you're a foreigner or a Taiwanese citizen. Some TASAT, and this is the Trans-Asia Sisters Association in Taiwan in which the uh, par participant was engaged. Um, some TASAT sisters get judged because of their skin color and their appearance, unquote. And I just want to note that the Taiwanese ID card is basically equivalent to Taiwanese uh, national nationality. So the civic legacies of Taiwan's recent de democratization movement, especially its ethnicity-based coalitions, largely hampered migrant advocacy as the latter proved to be a poor fit for indigenization campaigns and became ensnared in cross-strait politics. So despite its recent history of ethnic accommodation, Taiwan stands out among the three East Asian cases for its weak labor protections and underdeveloped support services for migrant workers at both the national and local levels. So in contrast to the improvements in the status and treatment of foreign residents resulting from civil society movements in Korea and Japan, neither local governments nor civil society organizations in Taiwan have succeeded in bringing about major immigration reforms or even the expansion of migrant rights. Instead, immigrant incorporation in Taiwan has largely followed a pattern of one step forward, two steps back. That is the expansion of rights for one specific category of migrants, largely spouse, spouses of Taiwanese nationals has been accompanied by the restriction of rights for others. 
Now, although various NGOs have provided services and advocacy for migrant workers and marriage migrants, their numbers pale compared to those in Japan and Korea. And more significantly, their voices are often drowned out by the anti-immigrant rhetoric of other civil society actors. Now, as was the case in Korea, foreign workers in contemporary Taiwan have faced many of the same problems that Taiwanese workers confronted only a few decades ago. Right? But rather than focus on areas of solidarity, as we see in Korea's case, Taiwanese labor union leaders, especially those that represent workers in the construction and manufacturing industries, which have historically had significant concentrations of indigenous or aborigine workers, have been among the most vocal critics of foreign workers who they claim have stolen jobs from Taiwanese citizens and depressed uh, wages. Now, the conflicting interests among uh, civil society groups within, within Taiwan are exacerbated by the peculiar configuration of migrant labor in contemporary Taiwan. Specifically, about a third of all foreign workers in Taiwan are engaged in domestic labor, most ostensibly as caregivers for the elderly. And because they work and live in the private homes of their employers, they're often excluded from labor rights protections as they're not considered to be workers by the state. And this can result in really serious uh, uh, problems and, um, and um, abuse. Um, some of the workers that I interviewed said that um, they had to take care of um, uh, you know, their, the elderly person for basically 24 seven, right? And, and some of them had to sleep in the same rooms. Some of them had to sleep in the same beds, right? because it, it did require this kind of 24 hour care. Others um, said that they had to um, you know, basically sleep in a hospital mattress um, uh, in the hospital room that was shared by like two other uh, patients because the person that they were caring for was, was seriously ill. Um, so, so obviously this system is really ripe um, for abuse. Now, one of the central problems, as I mentioned before, is uh, that so few domestic workers actually get a day off because they're not considered to be workers. And so this, this slide shows um, a picture is from the annual Where Is My Day Off uh, rally. So the one, the bigger one is from 2011, and then uh, the smaller ones are from uh, 2018. And in case you can't see um, the, the signs very well, it, they say uh, every week day off, domestic work is work, uh, and no harassment, violence, and overwork. Right? And you can see again that they are over overrepresented by uh, women as well, uh, most of them from uh, Southeast uh, Asia. Now, uh, the other point that I wanted to make is that the situation is compounded by the growth of local NGOs that represent the caregivers' employers, that is the elderly, the disabled, and working women, whose interests often conflict with those of the caregivers and their supporters. For example, women's groups, uh, as well as social welfare NGOs and NGOs representing the elderly and the disabled, have lobbied actively against a proposal to adopt the Household Services Act, which would regulate domestic work and provide labor protections, right? So clear this is really about kind of the, the conflict of interest. And also the Democratic Progressive Party, which as I mentioned earlier, has championed the rights of Taiwan's ethnic groups, the working class, women and LGBTQ communities has largely been indifferent and in some cases hostile to pro-immigrant advocacy. Some DPP supporters have expressed concern that advocacy for so-called foreigners detracts from the indigenization or localization campaign, whereby democratic uh, reforms have addressed the widespread demands for ethnic Taiwanese representation in Taiwan's po political, cultural, and uh, economic spheres. Uh, for example, um, a leading DPP supporter known for her progressive advocacy for women uh, challenged a pro-migrant activist at a, a rally stating, how can you protect foreigners? We must protect our own. So in sum, a splintered labor movement and civil society organizations viewed the arrival of new immigrants with suspicion. And rather than pushing for more liberal reforms to immigration policies, 
pressured the state to further restrict existing immigration and citizenship policies to guard against the displacement of native historically marginalized workers. The result has been a profound depoliticization of the mig migrant worker problem with commercial brokers holding uh, primary responsibility for importing, uh, distributing, administering, and even deporting migrant workers. So to conclude, instead of a single East Asian model of immigrant incorporation, what we find in Korea, Japan, and Taiwan are divergent approaches that have emerged out of similarly restrictive immigration and citizenship policies. So when the question of immigrant incorporation is embedded in a larger national struggle for democratization, migrant advocacy will likely gain powerful allies that can lend the struggle for migrant rights significant potency and magnitude disproportionate to actual migrant numbers. So in Korea, a decentralized rights-based approach to immigrant incorporation resulted in major structural reforms. Uh, networks of civil society activists who had played integral roles in Korea's struggle for democratization, including the vanguard groups of labor and women, as well as religious organizations, uh, human rights lawyers, and uh, various middle-class citizen organizations, applied the established language, symbols, and ideas of previous claims that were based on human rights, justice, and Korea's democratic development to demand policy reform using the tried and true strategies of mass demonstrations, candlelight vigils, petitions, public awareness campaigns, litigation, and lobbying. Now, when immigrant incorporation is embedded in ongoing grassroots movements for democratic inclusion, however, the priorities of migrant advocacy may be directed by the vanguard group whose interests may not necessarily align with those of recent immigrants. So in Japan, a decentralized residence-based approach to immigrant incorporation resulted in the proliferation of local incorporation programs and services, but no structural reforms, right? So grassroots activists in local communities with growing populations of foreign residents tapped into networks of local, local civil society activists who had been active in earlier movements to incorporate Zainichi Korean residents, applying the fam familiar language, symbols, and ideas of local citizenship as they collaborated with the local governments to pr provide services, raise public awareness, solve local level problems and cultivate foreign resident community leaders. Finally, when immigrant incorporation does not fit into existing civic legacies or threatens the status quo within civil society, migrant advocacy will likely be stalled, highly contentious and or uneven. So in Taiwan, the arrival of new immigrants threatened institutions that were founded on the ideational frame of indigenization, right, which had been really central to Taiwan's democratization movement. A handful of citizen organizations and activist groups from you know, labor, women's organizations, um, and human rights networks did in fact apply the language, symbols, and ideas of multiculturalism, uh, you know, um, human rights, and democratic inclusion, uh, also using the kind of established strategies of public performances, petitions, and rallies to make claims for migrant rights. So um, at the chapter five that I, um, where I'm focusing on the so-called marriage migrants, I describe the ways in which they were actually quite successful in pushing for uh, rights and recognition for um, migrant spouses of Taiwanese nationals, most of whom um, they were successful in doing for um, more Southeast Asian migrant uh, women rather than uh, mainland Chinese women. At the same time, their voices were often drowned out by those of other civil society actors that had rallied against migrant workers and uh, mainland Chinese migrants based on largely a zero sum contention that the expansion of migrant rights came at the expense, came at the expense of native Taiwanese gain. 
So instead of providing a receptive environment for immigrant and corporation, Taiwan civic legacies left migrant workers with few allies among civil society actors who saw no place for them in Taiwan's democratic uh, project. So in short, Whereas national immigration policies establish the parameters for legal entry, employment, and length of stay, it is the civic legacies of past struggles for democracy that shape the opportunities and hurdles for immigrant incorporation and claims making. We thus need to further examine the ideas networks and strategies of previous struggles for democratic inclusion to explain how some migrant claims lead to structural reforms, which migrants get included and excluded, right? And why civil society actors differentially impact immigrant incorporation. Okay, thank you. I will now stop sharing my screen. Wonderful, thank you. That was uh, such a rich, um, such a rich presentation. And having already read the book, I feel like I still learned more things through this presentation. So I want to thank you for that. I have a bunch of questions, but there are a couple of questions in in both the chat and then in the Q and A box. Um, I, I will say, I think what is sort of important and innovative and a takeaway for people who are working cross nationally on, on these questions is the way that you bring up the importance of this mezzo level of these actors that are, are non state actors and so we we don't really think about them we often think about public opinion individuals and then state actors and one thing that you just said about the Taiwanese case that made me uh, also think about this is you know how civil society actors also structure no of competition and group competition and whether uh, the inclusion of other migrants is, is, should be understood as a kind of zero sum game. So that's really something I didn't even think about. Um, in addition to, you know, economic crises, the way that actually these civic legacies also um, shape notions of, of uh, deservingness and, and um, uh, zero sum games or competition. So I have a couple of questions that I'm going to table for a minute and we'll take a couple uh, from, from the chat. So first from um, uh, Dr. Louise, Drew had a, a great question, which was, so if a French national married with a Japanese and living in Japan already some 10 years with self-employed activities, can they obtain um, Japanese nationality at some point soon? And, and maybe I would just add, is there a gender dynamic to this where, um, you know, it's more likely for a, 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 a foreign wife versus a foreign husband, something like that. Mm -hmm. So that's the first question. So um, thank you for that question. Um, so it's actually that's one of the big questions that I um, that that was uh, kind of central to my focus group interviews, and and that was kind of one of the the major um, kind of categories of questions that I asked to my focus group. So first, I should note that um, that all three countries do not prohibit. Um, the naturalization of particular um, uh, migrant groups, except for uh, migrant workers, like um, uh, so unskilled migrant workers. And so in, uh, in Japan and South Korea's case, um, unskilled migrant workers are not necessarily prohibited in law, but rather um, their visa status does not allow them to, um, uh, to reside in um, the country long enough um, continuously to be eligible for naturalization. And then in Taiwan, um, migrant workers are just downright prohibited <laughs> from naturalization. So that's the only case. But, um, but what's interesting about the naturalization question is that um, in Japan's case, as you're pointing out, um, the, the naturalization requirement um, for, uh, for, for uh, foreign residents is actually not that much different from what you see elsewhere, you know, like in the US or so forth. Um, it basically means, you know, requires five years of a continuous residency um, and um, it does require um, a, a, giving up your existing nationality because Japan does not uh, recognize dual nationality. And then, you know, there are other kind of more subjective criteria um, uh, in terms of like not having, um, you know, tr trying to overthrow, you know, the constitution or also um, 
kind of um, not trying to challenge uh, uh, forms of social stability. And this is kind of described in much more neutral language. So in the past, that sort of that fungible requirement um, was used, um, was kind of enforced in a very discretionary way by local bureaucrats who would basically say, um, you know, you're not eligible for naturalization unless you prove that you can assimilate into Japanese society. So this was a really a major problem for those, um, the, the largest population of foreigners who were trying to naturalize. Those were the, the multi-generational Korean residents known as Ainichi Koreans. And um, while most of them are in fact culturally assimilated, right? They, they um, uh, you know, mostly speak Japanese um, and only speak Japanese. <laughs> like most of them can't speak Korean. So over 80% don't speak um, um, uh, Korean fluently. Um, and the intermarriage rate itself is quite high. So there are you know signs that they are um, um, highly assimilated. Um, many of them still um, uh, maintained a Korean name, which, you know, not surprising, right? So, you know, in the U.S., we we would have like my name, Aaron Chung. You know, so the, my my first name is um, is, is 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 an anglicized name, but the, the last name is Chung still, even though it's Romanized. Um, in Japan's case, um, most uh, Koreans in Japan have um, a full Japanese alias in addition to their Korean name. So, um, you know. Uh, like uh, you might find somebody whose last name is not Kim, right? Like that, that's a Korean name, but rather Kimura, right? And so their entire name is, is Japanese. And so um, one of the kind of suggested or, or heavily encouraged requirements for naturalization had been in the past until the uh, 1980s to adopt a Japanese name entirely. And because most of the Koreans had already been um, quite assimilated to them, symbolically that meant giving up one's Korean identity entirely, because after you give up your name, um, you know, and your Korean passport, right, there's nothing left, there was no more connection, you know, to, um, to having a Korean identity. So that was considered to be one of the, um, the, the major barriers um, to naturalization. But um, since then, that requirement or that sort of encouragement has gone away, right? And, mm -hmm. and um, Japanese bureaucrats actually have tried to encourage naturalization, especially for the Zainichi Koreans. Um, you know, one of the top bureaucrats in the Ministry of Justice in regards to immigration policy, in fact, said this is, you know, if we encourage Koreans who are already highly assimilated to become Japanese nationals, they'll disappear. Right, so they won't be a minority anymore. They'll just disappear, right? Mm -hmm. And and um, and so so it's not so much that there are these kind of structural barriers, right? Um, but more, it, what I find interesting is that there are these lasting um, kinds of uh, civic legacies in regards to the naturalization question. So you know, it's not too surprising that Koreans would would be kind of reluctant to naturalize because um, of that kind of lasting link to Korea, but mostly because um, there are the colonial legacies, right? So there was um, a forced assimilation policy during the Japanese colonial period um, that um, really kind of have almost a direct link to the idea of naturalization in Japan. So it, it wasn't surprising that Koreans would resist this. But what I found fascinating is that um, even the new, more recent immigrants, like immigrants from ethnic Japanese immigrants from Brazil, right, were very much reluctant to naturalize. And um, what I found was that it's not because the requirements were necessarily um, so um, difficult. In fact, it's um, there's a five-year continuous residency requirement for naturalization, but a 10-year continuous residency requirement for permanent residency. But um, wow. there are far more uh, applicants for permanent residency in Japan than there are for naturalization. There are only 1%, less than 1% of the total foreign population naturalizes um, annually in Japan. Um, and so people would actually, you know, go for the higher, harder um, requirements um, than, than the easier one, largely because um, there is still a stigma attached to naturalization. And um, both local, both um, government officials, as well as um, kind of the street level bureaucrats, as well as civil society organizations, do not try to encourage um, foreign residents to naturalize, right? So when you, one, um, one focus group participant said that when he applied for permanent residency, he was from China and he'd lived in, in, in Japan for like 15 years. And you know, the local official said, you're free now. You can do whatever you want, <laughs> you know, in Japan, because you have permanent residency. There was nothing, there was no mention about, okay, this is how you might apply for naturalization in the future. Rather, it was basically permanent residency was seen as the final step 
of incorporation. And, uh, you know, of course, a lot of this also has to do with, with the rights that are associated with permanent residency. You actually have almost the same rights as a Japanese citizen, except voting rights, right? Um, mm -hmm. and, and so that is, so that's a long answer to you, <laughs> to, to, um, to do Drew's question that yes, you would be eligible um, if you had, um, whether or not you were a spouse, um, but if you had a uh, maintained um, continuous residency for five years. Absolutely, but I, I really like the response because it also reminds us, I think we have an automatic assumption that people want to naturalize and that naturalization means greater voice. And I think what you're showing is that there's actually a contradiction here where you might be able to more collectivize and keep your identity as permanent residents than, than um, as, as a naturalized individual. Um, okay, great. So we have another question here, um, anonymous question. Is it possible, so it's a question about case selection actually. So is it possible to generalize um, these three all through the lens of liberal democracy given their own unique circumstances. So that is, Japan is essentially a one party state and Taiwan has an unchangeable foreign constitution that governs citizenship and faces threat of foreign invasion for any change to citizenship laws. So is it possible to link these three coherently or do we instead view them as entirely separate or distinct? Hmm. That's, that's a really great question. Um, so, Yes, I, I did choose the three countries um, first based on their citizenship and immigration policies, right? So uh, as I mentioned, um, they are they were um, you know largely overlapping, and in fact, South Korea's uh, immigration policies were almost exact uh, carbon copies of of Japan's, right? Um, and so um, the policies themselves were. Um, not only overlapping, but in some cases identical, right? So that was kind of the basis for choosing them. But also um, I chose to um, uh, uh, just focus on um, the three countries that would be considered democracies um, rather than include, for example, China, which is obviously the elephant in the room. Um, any, any study of East Asia should include that, it should include China, but um, I decided that if I included China, then um, the explanation would would hinge too much on regime type, right? Um, you know that basically China is different from the rest of the cases. You know, we, and it would be too easy just to kind of rely on the regime regime type uh, question. Now, um, I do um, see your point though about whether or not the three countries could um, really be called liberal democracies, and that is definitely a point of debate, right? Um, uh, in, in the literature about um, whether or not uh, Japan, Korea, and Taiwan are truly liberal democracies as opposed to some other kind of, um, uh, you know, democracy with democracies with adjectives, right? Um, but, um, you know, at the same time, they all, all three have to, um, you know, basically are, are, are adhere to a certain level of democratic accountability. So even though we might say, um, you know, there are specific limits, right, um, and uh, to democracy in all three countries. And so as you were saying, um, you know, almost uninterrupted. Unter almost uninterrupted one party rule in, in Japan. And then um, Taiwan's um, very kind of contingent type of democracy that's um, contingent on um, cross strait relations. Um, and also just the fact that Taiwan is not um, necessarily recognized as a nation state by all countries, right? Um, and then um, also Korea's, you know, security, um, national security um, context has also allowed for um, a certain level of um, contingencies that are, um, you know, relative to um, the, the constant threat of invasion from North Korea. So yes, there are definitely these kind of, kinds of problems, but still, you know, the political leaders are nevertheless held accountable, right, um, for um, uh, maintaining democratic institutions. And, and um, you know, they, they also have to answer to the votes of, of their electorate, right? So, so I, do, I do think that there are, um, you know, generally speaking, very similar challenges and demands that political leaders do have to face because they, um, at least they operate um, as um, democracies of sorts. Absolutely. Um, thank you. So here we have another question. Um, I have a question about Taiwan. I didn't know that. So the, the previous question was actually very helpful for me to understand. I didn't realize that Taiwan um, has this uh, uh, kind of constitutional uh, limit on, on citizenship laws. Um, I will say, and uh, I, I mean, I, I don't want to detract from the conversation, but one thing that has been, as someone who doesn't work on East Asia, fascinating is um, looking at passport rankings, Taiwan's passport has been really growing in power um, very rapidly. And I was just kind of curious about that. Um, is it 
you know, is it because it's a small state and there's lots of control over who can get these passports? Is there like some kind of mo mobility diplomacy going on where they're opening up these visa dreams? So that's a, a side question. Um, uh, it, it, we have a question from the audience. Do you think that amending the nationality law in Japan to allow dual citizenship would encourage more the Nichi Koreans to naturalize, basically allowing them to maintain Korean identity and citizenship while obtaining voting rights in Japan? And would this potentially encourage more Nike Brazilian per Peruvians um, and more other more recent immigrants to naturalize and vote as well? Yes. Um, so absolutely, yes. <laughs> um, and, and this is something that has always come up in uh, my interviews with um, you know, more recent immigrants, but also with um, uh, Zainichi Koreans uh, when I was interviewing them for my first book in particular. So the, the question of um, the possibility of, of dual nationality um, for them is, is basically really the main inducement, like um, the idea that you, you don't have to give up in order to become a Japanese national because um, basically in my focus group interviews, um, there were two kind of sets of, of um, uh, you know, uh, reasons that were given for why they would not naturalize as, as Japanese. Um, one was the idea that even if they naturalized, they would not be recognized as, as Japanese. And this is this came up in, in um, the quote that I use for um, my chapter four, um, which is, I can't be Tanaka, <laughs> right? So this was an Ethiopian resident who said, you know, um, he married a Japanese woman. And, you know, when he was applying for permanent residency, um, the local bureaucrat said, okay, you know, are you going to apply? Are you Going to naturalize and, and you know the Ethiopian uh, re resident said no no I, I don't apply it and, he, and the, so the uh, bureaucrat asked why why would you not naturalize and and he said because I can't be Tanaka <laughs> no, no, you know basically even if I naturalize no one's going to recognize me as as being um, Japanese and um, you know some of the uh, Bangladeshi um, residents that I interviewed um, uh, you know said that you know this actually getting Japanese nationality caused more problems in some cases um, because they would be stopped on the street, right? And so foreign residents in Japan have to carry around their alien registration card with them at all times, right? But obviously Japanese citizens do not have to carry around their passports, right? And so um, you know, he was saying that he, you know, when he gets stopped, if he doesn't have his an alien registration, um, you know, card, um, but instead says, no, I'm Japanese, nobody's going to believe him. So he said that, that that actually makes him more susceptible to police harassment um, than than actually not having um, Japanese uh, nationality. Um, and then, but then the other kind of reasons, um, set of reasons that were given um, about why they didn't want to naturalize was because this idea that, that it, if you naturalize as a Japanese, you're giving up. Like the, that they basically said they have a, the, um, a problem with the term naturalization in Japanese, which is kika, which um, it, traditionally, which kind of um, in the colonial era meant submit oneself to the emperor, right? So it still has these really strong colonial overtones, right? Um, and um, still very much symbolically implies that you're, you're, you're you know, giving something up and obtaining some kind of privilege, um, but not necessarily acquiring kind of active citizenship and the rights and duties that come with it, right? Um, and so they, they said that because there's, there's this very deep symbolic significance that's associated with giving something up, um, they would not really want, they would not choose to naturalize, you know, um, for that reason. And, uh, but if, you know, if they, if dual nationality were instated, right, that would really change the meaning of, of Japanese citizenship. It would really get, it would really remove that, um, the idea that there is something very ethnoculturally pure or, or singular, right, um, um, to um, Japanese nationality, where you can actually equate Japanese nationality with Japanese ethnocultural um, um, identity. So yes, um, that was definitely um, an answer. And, it, and just as a side note, I, I should note that um, one of the reasons South Korea um, enacted dual nationality in 2010 was um, precisely to encourage um, so-called marriage migrants to naturalize because they realized that there were um, still relatively low rates of naturalization um, and they really wanted um, spouses of Korean nationals to become Korean citizens, you know, largely for the family, you know, the idea that, you know, they, they wanted um, uh, to protect uh, the the. the the family as a whole, the family union unit. Um, so basically, the idea was they would, would they would institute dual nationality um, to basically make it easier for um, uh, foreign spouses to naturalize. Mm 
I think your comment really, your response really makes me think of one thing that I really love about this book um, is, is the way that you actually deal with race and racial hierarchies and how those intersect with immigrant experiences. And I wonder if you could say a little bit more about that. Um, we have a question from Jeff that I'm actually going to post to you, but I, I, I think, you know, I know that you're hesitant to um, you know, push this to non-democratic states because the the sort of fight for democratic inclusion is is a big part of the story. But I can see resonances with this idea of there are brokers who are non-state actors who help you navigate racial hierarchies and, and gain access to rights. And I'm thinking, um, you know, we we often try to make these comparisons across regions, but you know, in the Middle East, the role of certain families or tribes and being able to have a patron who, who's kind of brokering with the state can, it can lead to inclusion. Um, but uh, also, I mean, you have this powerful quote that says, residuals of prior struggles for citizenship stru um, structure later struggles. So you're really sort of reminding us the importance of how racial minorities, women, um, other vulnerable groups get citizenship at previous or, or uh, get rights at previous periods in time, how that then influences the ability for migrants to, to, to be part of that. And again, I think the civil uh, civic legacies combines historical institutionalism, which is quite, it can be quite structural and path dependent with contentious politics and, and social movements. So it's a, it's a really, um, really uh, thoughtful framework that I think is really effective for thinking about race and comparative perspective, especially at this moment when there's a lot of um, kind of interest and in how do we, how do we think about race? And I think that what you do is you, you show us how to do it without it being just residual from the U.S model or thinking in these kind of black white terms. So I wonder if you could say just something about that. And then I'll also oppose at this moment, uh, Jeff's question. So Jeff said, um, this is Jeffrey Pugh, who's a, a professor at UMass Boston that of course, uh, Aaron, you know too, um, one of the uh, alums from uh, Johns Hopkins. You mentioned the resistance of labor activism for immigrants in Taiwan because of suspicion backlash against perceived threats to citizen interests. Did you see differences in the experiences of those migrants groups Groups with closer proximity to cultural identities or expressions of the dominant group compared to those seen as more different from the host society or whose culture was viewed more as oppositional to dominant cultural norms. And in other words, was tolerance for immigrant political activism mediated by any characteristics related to their identities? Um, and were some immigrants more able to engage in activism than others? Um, a really thoughtful question. It kind of relates to this idea of kind of racial hierarchies and, and, and ethnic boundaries. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm going to start with Jeff's question, if that's okay, just because um, I, I want to make sure I remember, because I, I have a lot to say about your, your question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so basically, what's really interesting um, in Taiwan's case is that, first of all, um, Taiwan really stood out to me, um, you know, among the three cases, uh, because it, it was the only one that did not claim to be, um, you know, ethnoculturally homogeneous, right, in, in terms of its kind of, um, its, its uh, kind of ideology and, and, um, and, you know, in fact, really embraced this idea of multi-ethnic society. Um, um, by really uh, giving voice to um, native Taiwanese uh, groups, right? So that that was kind of um, interesting. And so I expect I actually expected Taiwan to be the most progressive um, among the three cases, right? Because mm -hmm. it it claims to be multicultural, and it's also the only country that um, has used the language of being a country of immigration. Um, this is of course a very strategic use of this this term because it, it was used largely by the mainland Chinese minority um, to justify um, uh, you know their um, their own kind of long uh, martial law you know and and, and a minority uh, rule over Taiwan um, during Taiwan's um, authoritarian period and also as a way for them to include themselves <laughs> um, so when when um, the Democratic Progressive Party came into power and really kind of institutionalized um, these multicultural um, slash multi-ethnic policies um, a mainland Chinese political elite started saying we're immigrants too <laughs> so we you know basically we're part of this multicultural story. Uh, but what's been really interesting to see in terms of um, whether or not uh, activism for um, groups that maybe are are closer to uh, you know one one or another group, right? And like to the existing Taiwanese um, um, ethnic groups um, have been more effective. Actually, it's been the opposite, 
Right. So um, the major um, sources of, uh, of uh, major country sources of immigration are um, uh, Southeast Asian countries and then uh, mainland China. And uh, mainland Chinese um, migrants can only enter China as migrant spouses. So there, there actually is not a, a, um, an, a route open for migrant workers to come in from mainland China. Um, and they are not all. They are also not considered to be um, foreigners, so they're not counted among in this in the statistics for foreign nationals in in Taiwan. But um, if you look especially at the policies um, for mainland Chinese uh, migrant spouses, especially compared to uh, Southeast Asian uh, migrant spouses, mainland Chinese migrant spouses actually have greater hurdles to um, uh, uh, gain a naturalization, to, to gain Ch Taiwanese nationality and especially citizenship rights. So their residency requirement is longer than that for um, Southeast Asian migrant spouses. And once they have also actually have gotten Taiwanese nationality, they actually have to undergo a waiting period um, before they are eligible for all citizens, for full citizenship rights uh, in, in Taiwan. And um, you know the based on the interviews I did, and and um, you know much of that the reasoning was one, um, the idea that mainland Chinese are too similar, <laughs> right? They're too similar uh, to Taiwanese, and and therefore they could um, easily just sort of pass as being um, Taiwanese when actually they're not really Taiwanese, right? And so so there's this idea that that mainland Chinese who are who don't know, who are not familiar with democracy could potentially um, stain Taiwan's democracy by um, exercising the full rights of Taiwanese citizenship. So they need this longer waiting time to learn what democracy is like bef um, before becoming eligible for full rights um, of citizenship as, as Taiwanese. Um, and nationals. Um, and then there was this idea that um, uh, mainland uh, Chinese, um, uh, mainland Chinese were also, um, uh, in, in fact, um, a threat to ta uh, Taiwan's democracy that they could actually, um, you know, be seen as kind of a security threat, right? So it's kind of similar to the first one, um, but but they but the first one is really more about sort of treating them like as as children in a sense, like they 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 don't know democracy, therefore they need to learn. Um, and then the other viewpoint is basically treating them as potential spies, right? And and um, kind of infiltrating um, Taiwanese um, society. So it's actually the opposite of, of what we might expect in terms of um, kind of co ethnic um, um, affinity and so forth. Um, now, um, your question, Nura, about um, kind of the racial hierarchies and um, and and how um, that plays out in the three countries. So, um, what I um, argue, um, is, and especially I find really interesting, is that when I talk about the multiculturalism that is um, fr frameworks that are developing in the three countries, um, it's, it's a type of um, management of racial hierarchy in some ways, right, in, in the three countries. And um, in, in South Korea's case, I, um, I think it's, it's probably the most poignant in the sense that um, the visas that are given to a particular categories or subcategories of migrants um, are often actually based on a scriptive criteria rather than on the demands of the labor market, right? So um, the, you have you know, these marriage migrant visas. You also have an overseas Korean visa for uh, co-ethnic, uh, you know, immigrants, um, largely from uh, China, but also the United States um, and Japan and the former former Soviet Union. Um, and you have, then you have a variety of migrant worker visas. Um, and a, a couple of them are specifically for ethnic Koreans as well. And, and, and so um, these visas are, you know, are basically then based not just on um, your, the skills that you have um, uh, or even necessarily your country of origin, right? It's also based on your ethnicity and as well as your gender for in the case of marriage migrants. And, um, in the case of the co-ethnic visa, what was really fascinating was that um, um, when the co-ethnic visa, the overseas Korean visa was first, first instituted, um, uh, co-ethnic immigrants, so ethnic Koreans from China, as well as from the former Soviet Union were largely excluded 
they were not eligible for that visa uh, because the definition of overseas Korean um, was initially set as um, those who had um, previously had South Korean nationality and their descendants. The vast majority of um, uh, Koreans in China and the former Soviet Union are colonial era migrants. So they were they they migrated before the, the formation of the Republic of Korea in 1948, and um, and so you know by extension they were excluded, right? And they did, you know, they ended up filing a lawsuit and, and um, the, uh, you know, they, they actually won that lawsuit so that they became eligible in the end. But um, what was really fascinating was that this overseas Korean visa, which very clearly targeted um, uh, professionals, Korean American professionals in particular, but professionals, um, Korean uh, diasporic professionals from the United States um, and Japan, um, basically was a very generous visa that had, you know, kind of de facto dual nationality, um, rights um, and um, you know had uh, unlimited employment rights and and it could be renewed in um, uh, an unlimited amount of time but the only restriction on that visa was that initially was that um, those with that visa could not engage in manual labor right which really demonstrates for the class-based assumptions behind that visa, right? Um, and, um, you know, the fact that that uh, the vast the largest population of co-ethnic immigrants in Korea, those from China were excluded said a lot, right? From the, because they were largely migrant workers, right? Unskilled migrant workers as well. So that that is, um, you know, that's one way that we can sort of think about the ways in which these kind of, um, you know, pre-existing um, ideas and assumptions um, that are based on ascriptive criteria get institutionalized and therefore hardened mm -hmm. through visa categories in the case um, uh, of, uh, of, of these three countries. And, um, and the visa categories themselves end up really sort of perpetuating these, these hierarchies, right, among, um, among migrants um, that have, you know, uh, kind of um, very asymm asymmetric um, access to citizenship rights and employment rights and so forth, and even eligibility, right, to uh, uh, um, nationality. Hmm. Very powerful. So it, it reminds us, you know, how these visa categories are racialized, gendered, classed, as, as you put it, and and um, how they kind of get reproduced. But I think also your 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 comment really points to the importance of timing when people arrive um, and then how their time is counted by the state, what rights you have for each visa category, when you can get it, how long you have to be in it. And so how time is really kind of used as part of this um, enforcement mechanism. Um, uh, we, we don't have any audience questions. So I would love to you know, encourage the audience members, please feel free to post questions. Um, and in the meantime, I also just wanted to say we posted the, the dataverse. And um, you know, I, I hope that uh, our attendees who who um, are either working on research or, or advising students to, to, I would really encourage them to look at this. I think that we're constantly getting questions of how do we do our research under COVID, and this is a perfect example of how you know from your desk you could get access to this primary material, and it's so much richer than what's what can fit into one book. And so, really thinking about this as being um, a, uh, encouraging people to really, you know, um, check this out and share it um, and, and think about all the possibilities of, of, of how you can get actually ethnographic and kind of qualitative research even um, from far away. Um, so thank you for making that available to us. Um, and let's see if, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say that that when I um, archived um, the transcripts and translations, um, that was obviously before the, the pandemic, so I didn't really, yeah. um, I wasn't thinking that far ahead, obviously, but um, a lot of it too is is just about, um, one, it was really hard to organize um, the focus groups, and, um, you know, as far as I know, this is um, the only um, um, study that in engages or that employs um, original focus group transcripts of as many uh, immigrant communities as, um, you know, as 20 immigrant communities, and so one is that these, um, they were very difficult to organize because of language barriers. You, I actually had, to, I had to 
a whole army of research assistants, you know, who could speak the yeah. native languages of the um, of the foreign residents. But also, you know, it was really hard um, on migrant um, the migrant participants' time, right? It was really hard to find a, a time where everybody could actually get together, and that's why it was especially difficult in the Taiwan case, where really <laughs> they just could not commit to a, a, a set time. And that initial slide that I showed you, I forgot to mention, um, of, of Taiwan was. Um, uh, one uh, set of focus groups I did um, in the Taipei main station, where um, largely Indonesian, uh, you know, residents um, get together every Sunday, you know, and they all kind of sit picnic style um, in the middle of the Taipei main station. And, um, you know, some of the factory workers would tell me, you know, I can't commit to an, um, a focus group, but just come there, <laughs> just go there, you know, just go to the Taipei main, just meet us there at Taipei main station. Um, and that was the way that we were able to achieve it. So it, it it was it required a lot more um, uh, kind of planning and and um, resources than I think that most um, you know researchers can afford um, you know both in terms of time and and, and money and and um, support um, but also I also felt like in some ways um, as researchers of immigrants in particular of migrants. Um, you know, we sometimes replicate each other, right? We, yeah. we, we go to the same people, we ask the same questions and start from the kind of basic, um, you know, set of questions. And, um, and I think that can be really um, uh, kind of challenging for the migrants themselves who feel like, you know, why, do, why isn't there already a conversation going on <laughs> among you researchers who are always out, coming to us asking for the same interviews, but then you don't make any progress. You're just asking us the same questions and we just repeat ourselves. And so I also wanted to, um, to find a way to give voice um, to the migrants themselves and 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 also really kind of give value to their time um, uh, in that way. Yeah, I think that that's something we see definitely that kind of research fatigue with refugee populations in the Middle East who are just like you're asking us the same questions over and over and 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 not clearly not communicating. So I appreciate that. Okay, we have three questions that just came in. Um, I'm gonna pose them all at once and then I'll, I'll let you decide how to take the order. So is the more restrictive development of the immigration regulations in Taiwan observed amongst all immigrant categories or only amongst the relatively low or unskilled workers? Um, the policy implications, should this, restrictive, um, should this restrictive development be overall? Can, um, can we consider, you know, considering also the high rate of brain drain in Taiwan? Um, and so uh, thinking of, about th that kind of tension. Um, then the, the next question is uh, from Raquel uh, Obregon. I hope you're pronouncing your name properly. Can you expand on the situation of Peruvian Japanese? Um, populations. And then the last question from um, John Trumpdor. Um, could you say more about anti-immigrant ideologues, politicians, and movements in these societies? So I recall your earlier book on Japan had an opening quot a quotation from a governor in Japan who openly referred to the foreigners in Japan as sneaky thieves and other Trumpy language. Um, so yeah, thank you. That's a, that's a great question. So um, the, the, do you want me to reread them or you, you have? Um, could you just reread re re the second one? I, I I didn't, I don't think I, oh, I uh, the, uh, the situation of Peruvian Japanese okay. uh, immigrants. Yeah. Like what, what is it, their situation? Yeah. Or, could you okay. expand on their situation? Okay. Okay. Um, so thank you. I'll, I'll try to go through them quickly. Um, uh, one is, uh, all of the populations that I um, focused on were largely, um, well, in terms of especially policy, were largely unskilled workers, right? Because I think that, you know, we can say, um, you know, pretty generally that um, professionals um, in immigrants uh, who are in the, the professional category um, often don't face um, quite as nearly as many barriers, right, in terms of entry as well as, um, uh, you know, their, um, their kinds of rights that are extended in any country. And that's, that, I think that goes across uh, regime type. And sometimes, you know, as you know, in, um, Nura, in your research, right, um, yeah. uh, professionals from so certain countries, you know, like European countries and, and US um, often get even more privileges, right, than, mm -hmm. um, than the natives themselves, right? So that's, that's, um, so that's one of the reasons why I, I focus largely on kind of unskilled uh, workers, and and no, there um, there isn't a consistency in terms of the policy for um, you know skilled and professional workers versus um, unskilled. Uh, you know, basically, uh, 
the poli you know, all three countries are kind of um, competing, um, you know, with each other as well as with countries like Singapore to actually attract more, you know, professional uh, immigrants um, and um, and to attract more, um, you know, much more e well educated um, uh, immigrants into into their midst. So that's a totally different kind of matter in some ways. And and I know that there are um, a number of really great studies um, that look at professional uh, immigrants and how they're treated. But I I feel like um, that would in many ways, um, you know, really devalue the story about kind of the unskilled workers in the case of, of Japan, Korea, and Taiwan, because it is a totally different type of standard that's applied uh, to them. Um, and then um, about uh, Peruvian uh, Japanese. Um, so uh, the the Japanese ethnic Japanese from um, Peru were um, as well as from Brazil were brought in um, with the uh, a revision of the immigration um, uh, policies in Japan, um, especially from uh, the late 1980s, um, but mostly from the 1990s. And they were among the fastest growing group of um, immigrants to Japan because um, uh, because of their co-ethnicity. So they were although they were not acknowledged as workers, they were basically given a special law. Um, a long-term resident visa, which they were only they, the co-ethnics were eligible for, um, that uh, gave them, um, again, unlimited employment rights, as well as um, um, long-term residency rights and, and access to the many benefits that I mentioned before, social welfare benefits that um, that settled foreign residents um, are eligible for in Japan. Um, but their numbers start to started to go down um, toward uh, the in the in the 2000s, especially. Um, uh, following the major economic recessions um, in Japan, um, because uh, basically following the economic recession, like the, the major economic recessions um, in the 2000s, um, uh, you know, most of the, the contract migrant workers or industrial trainees basically had to go to were deported right or they were returned um, because they were no longer on contract but those who had the co-ethnic immigrants from brazil and and peru had these long-term residency visas that basically meant that they could stay in japan and and stay unemployed and even have access to unemployment assistance right to employment assistance and and so um uh Japanese officials saw them more as a drain to the system, and it sort of was a backfiring of their initial attempt to, to kind of uh, bring in um, co-ethnic immigrants through these side doors, you know, as migrant workers. But instead, they ended up staying, right, and 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 really draining on on um, uh, draining the economy, as as some of the officials put it. Um, so instead, they actually used um, a, a system that was modeled after Spain, which was a pay to go system, right, where they paid um, those who had this long term residency visa, again, um, um, the vast majority of them being co ethnic immigrants from uh, Peru and Brazil um, to, you know, go back to um, their countries, um, and they would not be eligible to return um, using the long-term residency visa for um, a sustained period of time. So it was basically kind of a way to um, sort of retract that particular system. So, um, you know, in some ways, it, it I think, I think their situation was really fascinating because um, the assumption was that co-ethnic immigrants would pose the most minimal threat to social stability because they're assumed that, you know, because they look the same or, you know, they're, they're Japanese by ethnicity, they would be able to assimilate. But in fact, it's the very co-ethnic immigrants who actually had the lowest rates of Japanese language fluency and um, also had um, high rates of um, truancy among their children um, and, and were in many ways the most unassimilated, you know, in local communities and and so it was kind of this this backfiring of these kind of um, these assumptions about co-ethnicity um, and then finally um, the anti-immigrant um, ideologies that so obviously I can't talk too much about it because we have we are short on time but but just to um, kind of the the main uh, pattern that we um, might observe is that um, there has been um, you know not the same level of vi um, kind of anti-immigrant violence that we see in uh, in um, the U.S. And, and in Europe, but um, there has been quite a bit of anti-immigrant backlash, right, um, in uh, in all three countries. But um, what's really interesting is that they are not necessarily um, uh, kind of responding to new immigration, 
right? So any type of anti-immigrant uh, back backlash or anti-foreigner backlash that we've seen in Japan um, and South Korea and to a lesser extent Taiwan has actually have actually been um, not so much to to like liberalized immigration policies, but rather to um, the so-called special privileges of specific categories of migrants. So in Japan, it's largely been an anti-Korean um, backlash and not recently arrived Koreans, but rather mostly the Zainichi, the colonial era migrants who have the special permanent residence visa that gives them more um, um, citizenship rights, right? So that basically the even the movement Zaitokukai, which is like the anti-Korean group is like, um, is, is short for um, basically anti-Korean, but anti-special privileges of the Korean <laughs> group, right? So it's, it's, it's really targeting them. And then in Korea, much of the backlash has been toward the marriage migrants who um, have been eligible for, um, again, certain uh, subsidies as well as um, uh, what might be called kind of affirmative action type of policies for their children um, to the point where um, the term multicultural is used in reference to their families, like multicultural family. Um, and it, uh, some of the field work um, of these families or research on these families has shown that now the term multicultural is used as a slur among kids to bully other, to bully the kids. So it's like, hey, multicultural, because <laughs> they're often singled out for these special um, privileges. And then finally, in the case case of um, in Taiwan, um, most much of the anti-immigrant backlash was um, toward the marriage migrants as well. And that was basically um, based on this idea that that um, these poorly educated women from Southeast Asia were marrying poorly educated men in Taiwan and, there, and therefore contributing to lessening the so-called population quality uh, within Taiwan. So, that, so in fact, you, you actually had lower rates of so-called marriage migrants coming in um, in Taiwan than in, in Korea. So, so much there. And, and again, um, I, I think that your response to one of these questions and, and, and Jeff's really sort of challenges our assumptions about what it means to be co-ethnic and, and being co-ethnic is being privileged. And that also, you know, just to keep bringing up the comparative perspectives really makes me think about Arab migrants in the Gulf and how the fact that they spoke the same language and could pose this Arab nationalist threat meant that they were seen as more threatening uh, politically than than the non-co-ethnics. Non um, so the, we are out of time, but I want to really thank Professor Chung for this fantastic presentation and discussion and, and really um, thank you to the attendees for all your questions and for sticking around. Um, we will be, there are a couple of questions about uh, whether we, you'd be able to watch this. I think that Laura just put the, the YouTube video, it'll be available tomorrow. Um, I want to make a quick plug for next week at the same time. We'll be having Professor um, Kristen Chirac discuss uh, her recent research on millionaire mobility and the sale of citizenship. Um, so thank you, Professor Chung, and, and have a great day, everyone. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. <laughs>